Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Dr. Harker, uh, friends, it's, it's an honor to be back on campus, uh, a campus that literally, not figuratively, played such a significant role in, in shaping my life. During my years on campus here, some of the most transformative events of my generation took place. It was here, it was here in October of 1962 that literally as many of us as could squeeze into a place we used to call the scrounge, the student center used to be over, over by the beach. And we listened and we watched in the black and white television as John Kennedy warned us of the impending showdown with Russia over Cuba, the Cuban Missile Crisis. And one year and one month later, I was literally standing on the steps of Hullion Hall when I heard of John Kennedy's death. I remember going in the parking lot and one of the day students had a car and we sat in the car and we listened to the tragic news. With my friends in the lounge in Harder Hall, up the small here where I, uh, where I had my room, I remember the late night debates as the drum beats of the impending war in Vietnam got louder and louder. But I, I remain grateful. grateful. I remain grateful, grateful to the professors, professors I had here, like, like Dr. Dr. Bennett of the, the political science bar, Dr. Dr. Paul Dolan, one of the great men I knew here, and maybe the smartest man that ever taught me, Dr. Dr. David Ingersoll. All of them, all of them helped me understand and make some sense of those events as the world seemed to be swirling out of control in the mid-60s. They not only believed in me, they believed that we each had something to contribute to the public debate. They convinced my generation of that. And my message to all of you students here today is, you have, you have a great deal to contribute. We need you badly to be part of the public discourse and the politics of this country. And the University of Delaware didn't just shape me in this historic presidential campaign. Ladies and gentlemen, this may be the first time in presidential campaign history that our campaign manager, a Delaware named David Pluff, who was in the political science department, a proud blue hand, is managing one campaign. And my friend John McCain's campaign, his chief strategist, is a guy named Steve Schmidt, who also attended the University of Delaware. Now let that be a cautionary tale. Blue hands can go astray occasionally. But I'm proud, I'm proud that this great university has instilled that kind of, that kind of intensity in its graduates and its students that are here. Ladies and gentlemen, when I came back here in 1972, as a 29-year-old kid running for the United States Senate, I was embraced by my old faculty and supported by my university. I said in that fall while I was running, I said our failure has not been the failure of the people to meet the challenges before them, but rather it's been a failure of both the great political parties to place the challenges honestly and squarely before the American people. And that, too, today, remains our central challenge. When I came back to the Bob one week after September 11th to speak to a packed group of students at the Bob, I said then of those horrific attacks, we will not, cannot, and must not change our way of life. This is the beginning and the end of the way of life for international terrorist organization not a change in our lives. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that is unfinished business. And that's one of the reasons why I agreed to run as Vice President of the United States of America with Barack Obama. Today, I return here 36 years after you first gave me the honor of serving you. And four days before our nation chooses the 44th President of the United States of America. But I come today with greater confidence and passion about the ability of this country to change and make things better. I believe we are literally on the cusp of a new era of American leadership in the 21st century. I believe that with every fiber in my being. For I believe, I believe 
This country is ready to make the sacrifices necessary and to embrace the change we need to restore the hope of our people and once again, once again, become the beacon of light for the entire world. That's our responsibility. That's our possibilities. That's what we must do. And ladies and gentlemen, I would not have joined this ticket did I not believe Barack Obama will be the president this moment demands. To repeat what my wife said, this is, this is the single most important election in any of our lifetimes. She referenced my 91-year-old mom who's standing here, not even sitting. God love you, mom. Fortunately for me, my mom lives with us. And ladies and gentlemen, literally, literally, as I come down the driveway and stop to kiss her goodnight or say hello in the morning, my mother, my mother, 91 year, years old, like your mothers and grandmothers, they believe, they believe in our possibilities because they know their generation weathered tougher times than we have seen, and they emerged from each of the crises they faced stronger. Ladies and gentlemen, never, ever, ever in all of American history have the American people ever let their country down, not once, and not now either. Folks, I know George Bush well, and he's a decent man. But ladies and gentlemen, history, history is going to judge his administration harshly, not merely for the mistakes they've made, and they've made many, but because of the opportunities they squandered. The opportunity to take a strong economy they were given and make it even stronger and broaden the capacity of this great country. The opportunity, in the face of tragedy, to unite our nation in pursuing great goals. The opportunity in the face of an emerging threat of global terror to unite the world in common purpose. Imagine, imagine if John Kennedy or Franklin Roosevelt had been president on 9-11. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bush legacy, the one that John McCain wants to continue, is an America where we're divided from each other a nation divided from the world. But ladies and gentlemen, an opportunity missed is not an opportunity lost. Not yet. Not if we recognize the urgency of the moment. Not if we have the courage to reject the course that we're on, which has clearly failed. And not if we'll embrace the most enduring American belief, one that was instilled in me here at this great university. And that is, we do not have to accept things the way they are. We can change them. We can change them. And we will, we will change them. Folks, folks. In order to do that, to state the obvious, Jill said this is an election about you. And it is. It's not about us. But we need you. We need you badly. Your nation needs you now. Here in Delaware, we need you to help elect my friend Jack Markell, one of the most talented people to run for governor in the United States. And we need you to elect Matt Dent, our lieutenant governor, who is indefatigable. But ladies and gentlemen, we need not just your votes. We need you to bring others along, to make the phone calls, to knock on doors. And for those of you willing to help influence our neighbors to the north in Pennsylvania, you can sign up here right after this rally is over. People walking around with clipboards. Every single morning between now and Election Day, Bustles will leave this campus and leave from Wilmington to help our cause in Pennsylvania. Volunteers are walking around campus with clipboards. You can sign up right after this rally, and we need you to do so. Because, ladies and gentlemen, this is the single opportunity we have. There's only about five times in all of American history where we've been at one of these inflection points, where we literally, literally, literally have a chance to change the course of history. And with your help, 
With your help, we can begin to imagine a better future. So I ask you to imagine with me. Imagine an America that once again is respected in the world for the power of its example and not just the example of its power. Imagine. Imagine a president who is strong enough to confront our enemies, wise enough to enlist our allies, and sure enough to end this war in Iraq. Imagine a country where by 2025 we generate 25% of all our energy from renewable sources. Imagine a country that once again invests in research and development and actually believes in science. Imagine a country that rebuilds our roads, our airports, builds the tomorrow's infrastructure, universal deployment of universal access to broadband. Ladies and gentlemen, this is all, as my brother would say, within our wheelhouse. We're all capable of doing this. Imagine, imagine a country that actually encourages companies to stay and grow in America rather than give them tax breaks to go abroad. Imagine a country where everyone who is qualified to go to college can afford to go and where you graduate without being tens of thousands of dollars in debt. And imagine a country where every American has access to affordable health care for them and their families. Imagine a country that can bring back jobs to our communities, give the middle class a fighting chance. Ladies and gentlemen, when I was growing up not far from here in Claymont, Delaware, and in Mayfield, our neighborhoods literally, literally were teeming with mothers and fathers who told us that if we worked hard, if we were honest, if we loved our country, there wasn't anything we couldn't do. We believed it, and we did it. Well, Barack and I know, know how much we owe this country. Barack was raised by a single mother and his grandparents. My family came here, as my wife said, because we'd fallen on pretty difficult times in Scranton. But in the face, in the face of these struggles, Barack's family believed in the promise of the country. My father and mother never doubted, never doubted that the American dream was real and could be mine and my brothers and sisters. That's what mothers and fathers and neighbors all around this country need to believe again, because now so many look at their children after having them having played by the rules, done everything right, and seen things wiped out from under them. There is doubt, ladies and gentlemen, the next president of the United States of America has to restore that ability so that once again, every neighborhood in America is teeming with mothers and fathers who not only say, but believe like our parents did in their heart, that in fact there's nothing, nothing beyond the reach of their child. And you know, if we're elected, God willing, we're going to face some of the most difficult challenges this country has ever seen. But ladies and gentlemen, great presidents have always viewed challenges as opportunities. Great presidents have always turned what looked like a loss into a significant step forward for America. And how have they done it? They've done it by reminding our fellow Americans of the challenges we faced in the past and how we overcame them, by bringing them together, but most of all, by appealing to their hopes not their fears, appealing to their better angels. And ladies and gentlemen, that's why I am so certain, and I am certain Barack Obama will appeal and unite this country because he'll appeal to America's better angels. And ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, I believe that John McCain, through the conduct of this campaign, unfortunately, continues to think that the way you win is to divide. I believe Barack Obama will revitalize the middle class, the backbone of the nation. I believe John McCain is stubbornly clinging to the failed policies of the past. Because if he acknowledges the failure, what does he talk about? I'm not being deadly earnest. I believe Barack Obama will restore our standing in the world. But I know that John McCain continues to be determined 
to follow the policy of going it alone. Ladies and gentlemen, in a dangerous world, Barack Obama has demonstrated sound judgment. In a turbulent economy, Barack Obama has demonstrated a steady hand. In difficult times, Barack Obama has shown that he understands what families across this country are going through. And to a nation desperate for a better day, Barack Obama has offered new ideas, new leadership, and real hope. Ladies and gentlemen, Barack Obama will remind us that we are, unlike our opponents, continue to divide us. Sarah Palin and others talking about being in the pro-American part of the, one, of the country, as if all America is not pro-American. Ladies and gentlemen, Barack will remind us we are one nation under God. We are indivisible. Our best days are ahead of us, not behind us. Look, I believe that's a sentiment. And some of you heard me say this for the past 10 years. Well, I believe that sentiment, that sentiment, hope and optimism, lives in the hearts of the vast majority of Americans, Republicans, Democrats, and Independents. And I think it's best expressed by my favorite contemporary poet, Seamus Haney. He wrote a poem called The Cure of Troy. And there's a stanza in that poem that I think should be our anthem. He said, history says, don't hope on this side of the grave. But then, once in a lifetime, the long-for tidal wave of justice rises up, and hope and history rhyme. So I ask you today, join me, join Barack, join us in making hope and history rhyme for this great nation. Get up, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all. And may God bless you, and may God protect our truth. Thank you, University of Delaware. I love you. Thank you.